Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to approach the subject of benign neck masses here. And together with malignant neck masses, these make up our neck tumors, excluding lymphoma. Uh, so uh, you're going to notice that the benign neck tumors, excluding lymphoma, are primarily in the pediatric population, whereas the malignant neck masses are, uh, are seen in the adult population, namely squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. So we're going to talk about hemangioma, teratoma, and laryngeal papilloma. So the hemangioma of the neck is a tumor involving blood vessel epithelial cells, and basically this just results in an abnormal collection of vessels. This can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Uh, it's pretty obvious when you look at it. Uh, if you look at the histology, you'll see exactly what I mean. You just have a garbled up clump of, uh, of, of capillaries where they shouldn't be. And this results in the discoloration of the skin or this papule. This is the most common tumor of the head and neck in pediatric patients. And there's various types. The most important, because it's the most common, uh, that you should remember is the capillary hemangioma. And if you work in a pediatric ward, you will see this within three or four weeks, especially if you work with young children, like a year or two old. And uh, so what this is, is uh, a, typically a cutaneous lesion. It can present as nevus flamius, which is a sort of a two-dimensional lesion, like a birthmark, or a strawberry nevus, which is like a red mole. Um, Typically, it presents as a cutaneous lesion. However, you can have extracutaneous capillary hemangiomas, and those typically are in the liver. And when they're in the liver, they can be problematic because you can get high output cardiac failure. I discussed this in the liver tumor section way back in uh, general surgery. Uh, but generally, capillary hemangiomas are benign, apart from the fact that the parent will come to you uh, really upset because their baby has this red mole and it's getting bigger. And that's typical of capillary hemangiomas. So the baby will be born with maybe a little red spot. Parent doesn't think anything of it. As the baby gets older, it begins to get bigger. But the good news is capillary hemangiomas will spontaneously regress. So most of the time, nothing needs to be done about this other than watching it. Ca uh, cavernous hemangiomas are more common in adults, and in contrast to capillary hemangiomas, these tend to stick around. These occur in deeper tissues, namely the CNS, the brain, uh, the liver, and uh, you can also get uh, optic cavernous hemangiomas. Arteriovenous hemangiomas can occur in various places. These are also known as arteriovenous malformations, and these are especially associated with congenital syndromes. Uh, some that come to mind are rendu osler uh, weber syndrome, uh, which is where you get all those GI telangiectasias. Um, that's an autosomal dominant disease. Um, Sturge-Weber syndrome, which I'll show you some pictures of, that's specifically uh, specifically notable because you have uh, just a one-sided uh, nevus flamius. Uh, Kasselbach-Merritt syndrome, where you can get the uh, hemangioma that develops and it can actually sequester platelets, and that results in TTP and uh, MAHA. And so there's lots of different congenital syndromes that are associated with these AVMs. Invasive hemangiomas, uh, in contrast to these other ones, extend deeper into the subcutaneous tissue, uh, even as far down into the muscle. And so these are usually presenting as a mass that's painful and palpable. Subglottic hematomas usually present at birth, and this is a, a uh, actually sorry that should say hemangioma not hematoma. <laughs> Subglottic hemangiomas prevent usually at birth and they block the airway. And so these are associated with strider and airway obstruction. And so you'll note this when you go and do direct visualization because the baby has airway obstruction. You'll note the hemangioma, and I'll show you a picture of that. 
So the symptoms depend on the specific type of hemangioma, of course, we kind of talked about that. Cutaneous hemangiomas are grossly visible, invasive hemangiomas are palpable and non-compressible masses, and uh, some of these other ones uh, we sort of discussed as well. Uh, for diagnosis, the capillary hemangiomas can be diagnosed clinically just on gross physical exam. Cavernous hemangiomas are best diagnosed with CT and contrast, although you may do, uh, uh, you, you might do an ultrasound first, uh, but they're best diagnosed with CT and contrast because you'll be able to see the contrast pooling where that hemangioma is. Invasive hemangiomas, again, you'll suspect this based on physical exam. Doppler sonogram is another good one to go to because it shows if there's arteries or capillaries or there's blood pooling. Um, you can do CT, but the most accurate test is an angiogram. And the subglottic hemangiomas are diagnosed with direct visualization, either bronchoscopy uh, or laryngoscopy of the airway. So this is a nevus flamius. You can see it just looks like a red birthmark. And this is just two-dimensional. You can't feel anything here. It's just a red mark. Here's nevus flamius in the setting of Sturge-Weber syndrome. So it's a, it's a, a unilateral, one-sided uh, nevus flamius. It doesn't cross the midline. And that's typical of Sturge-Weber syndrome. Other things you see with Sturge-Weber syndrome, uh, seizures, uh, mental retardation, uh, other uh, neurologic deficits. Again, another, it's not always on the right side, but this is another unilateral. This is Mikhail Gorbachev, former leader of the Soviet Union. He has that typical nevus flamius on his head. He's probably the most famous port wine stain. Mm. Um, the strawberry nevus is, you can see, it's palpable. It's, uh, it extends up. It's, these are papules. And so that's what distinguishes it from the port wine stain, from the nevus flamius. It's not as visible here, but this is another strawberry nevus. And this might get bigger as the child gets older, and then it'll spontaneously regress. Here's another one. So you can imagine that a parent sees this, they're going to want something done right away. But it doesn't necessarily mean we have to do anything right away. Uh, this is a subglottic hemangioma, so this is just direct uh, visualization via rigid bronchoscopy, and you can see that there's uh, something obstructing the airway. So for treatment, um, unless the uh, hemangioma is grotesquely large, uh, the cutaneous heman capillary hemangiomas are typically just left to be. Uh, if they don't regress by the time the kid starts school, then you can use steroids uh, or surgical removal to, uh, to remove the, uh, the hemangioma. So it really is on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, the subglottic hemangiomas are going to require airway stabilization, steroids, and laser excision because you have more of an emergency on hand there. Okay, teratoma of the neck. Teratomas are neoplastic growths of multiple different tissue types that are foreign to the part of the body in which they arise. And these are due to postmeiotic germ cells. Teratomas can be benign or malignant, but when you are dealing with a teratoma in a child, it's almost always benign, whereas with an adult, it has a tendency to be malignant. Uh, either way, if you have a teratoma, if you want to be reassured that it's benign or uh, check to see if it's possibly malignant, you can draw an alpha fetoprotein marker. An alpha fetoprotein is the marker for teratomas. Uh, so that may be part of your workup. Cervical teratomas are usually present at birth. Uh, they can get larger, and so they may present shortly thereafter, but they can present at birth. They may even diagnose it antenatally via ultrasound, and I'll show you a picture of that. The average size at presentation is 5 to 12 centimeters, and they're typically unilateral. And the symptoms will usually present uh, due to tracheal compression, and the baby will have strider because the, uh, because the teratoma is large enough to compress the trachea and interfere with breathing. 
and that can go as far as causing cyanosis. Uh, if you do x-rays, you'll see tracheal deviation, you'll feel a palpable neck mass, and it may present as neck swelling too. For diagnosis, the best initial diagnostic step when you suspect a teratoma is a CT, and this should always be followed by a fine needle aspiration. The reason we're following it with a fine needle aspiration is because we want to get a histologic diagnosis and also because we want to differentiate this from something that can look like this, and that is a meningoencephalocele. Uh, for treatment, it's going to be surgical removal. So this is a huge teratoma of the neck. Here's another one. I couldn't find any pictures of small teratomas, but these are pretty grotesque. And here's a, an example of a, uh, a antenatal diagnosis where you can see the neck mass here. And finally, the laryngeal papilloma. This is the most common laryngeal tumor uh, although it's rare overall, only about two or three in uh, every 100,000 people will have a laryngeal papilloma. It uh, can present at any age. Uh, typically, however, when it presents in children, it's going to be multiple uh, masses, and when it presents in adults, it'll be a single solitary mass. The cause, as Mostly anything that's, caused, uh, that's called a papilloma is the human papilloma virus, and that's caused by HPV 6 or 11. This is not an STD, so children can get this. This is not caused from oral intercourse or anything like that. Typically what happens is that the, uh, the HPV virus is transmitted to the child during vaginal delivery from an infected mother. There's no evidence that this is related to any kind of sexual activity. The symptoms uh, are going to, if you can imagine what you'd have if you have blockage on the airway, uh, it's going to be hoarseness, strider, and eventually obstruction. This is usually a slow progression. A change in voice can be noted because remember that your larynx is your voice box. So uh, you might notice uh, a change in voice. This is usually a pretty slow progression over 6 to 12 months. For diagnosis, it's going to be bronchoscopy or laryngoscopy. However, the most accurate test to know, to really nail down that this is a laryngeal papilloma, is a biopsy. However, you're not usually going to need to do that because these are pretty apparent when you look at them. Uh, but I wouldn't rule out maybe doing a biopsy, if, you know, you really want to nail down the diagnosis. So the treatment is surgical resection, and that can be done in uh, one of two ways, either laser vapor, uh, vaporization or cold knife resection. Uh, in patients who have recurrent cases, and many cases are recurrent where you remove it and it comes back, you can use the drug uh, cytopavir, and that uh, tends to reduce the recurrence. One thing I will note, if you can at all avoid doing any kind of tracheostomy or instrumentation, excessive instrumentation, you should avoid that because what's inside these papillomas are a bunch of HPV viruses, virions, and when you disrupt that, you're going to seed the larynx and you can cause more papillomas. So it's important to try to keep the instrumentation to a minimum. So here's uh, multiple papillomas on the larynx. These are your laryngeal folds here and these are papillomas. There's two of them right here, a little bit larger than the last one. And this is one right here.